Good late morning. And welcome, everybody. Will uh, Regina Williams please come forward? Ms. Williams will lead us in singing the national anthem, after which we ask that you please remain standing for the invocation. So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that still there oh oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave oh the land We place ourselves in God's presence, no matter what our faith tradition is, and we pray in these words. Lord God, Creator, we seek your blessing and assistance for these new law school graduates. May they have all the virtues and qualities of good and honest attorneys. May they be trustworthy with confidences, accurate in analysis, correct in their conclusions, able in argument loyal to their clients, honest with all, and while at the same time being courteous to adversaries. Give them consciences formed by the law of the land and the ability to read the laws of nature instilled in every human heart by you, the Creator. May the sacrifices of their law school careers bring about joys in the future, and gainful employment. <laughs> and may they pass the bar at the first attempt. <laughs> if they are prepared. <laughs> and we ask this in your holy name, O Lord, amen. amen. That cheerleader was the most Reverend Nicholas de Marazio, Bishop of Brooklyn. Thank you. Oh, will everybody be seated? Can't see. Welcome to the members. Welcome to the members of the class of 214, and the alumni parents and alumni spouses and other alumni relatives of the graduating students seated on the stage including former Brooklyn Law School Dean, United States District Court Judge Leo 
I. Glasser, a member of the class of 1948. Today we, today we extend a warm welcome to the family and friends of our graduates and thank them for all the support and encouragement that helped make it possible for the graduates to reach this day. I ask all of our graduates to give their families, friends, loved ones a warm round of applause for putting up with you. <laughs> I shall uh, begin the program by calling on John David Moore, valedictorian, to speak on behalf of the class of 2014. John? Good morning. Uh, it is a profound honor to stand before you today, uh, and I'm truly humbled to be here. In many ways, it's completely inappropriate for me to be standing alone here right now. Uh, to tell you the truth, this may be the first thing I've done alone since I came to law school. And that was definitely not my expectation. When I got to Brooklyn, my expectation of law school was that it would be a grueling, isolating experience where I'd be surrounded in class by cutthroat academic mercenaries looking to ruin me at every opportunity. Uh, the graduating members, thank you for not being like that. From the very first day, I was surrounded by people I liked and respected and who weren't out to get me, at, at least not overtly. What I realized very quickly was that law school was not going to be the grueling slog I'd first imagined. On the contrary, I was going to be working together with fantastic people every step of the way. Now, I had the additional pleasure of belonging to the best study group in the best section in the school, uh, but be it... Uh, thank you to both of you. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, but be it in study groups, sections, classes, or whatever else, law school is something that we, as a class, have done together. And together, as a class, we've done quite a lot. We try to decipher the shifting rules of privity and figure out why the elevators never seemed to come when we were running late for class. We encountered and had to translate strange Latin phrases like nulla pina sin lege, uh, which uh, for the non-lawyers uh, means no punishment without legs. And... <laughs> And, and race ipsa loquitur, uh, which I won't bother to translate because I think it speaks for itself. <laughs> uh. Together, we fretted over the mysteries of the curve and the blue book, and we poured over the federal rules of civil procedure. We tried to keep straight faces when our legal writing professor said things like, Iraq is good for memos, but always use crack when you're writing a brief. <laughs> Along the way, we even learned the law. The point is, everything we did, we did together. We worked together in class, and we ate lunch together in the cafeteria. We studied together and freaked out together when final season began. We cheered each other up, and we stressed each other out. But from the very first day, we were never alone. We did it all together. And I really can't tell you how much it means to me to have been able to share this law school experience with each one of you. Even beyond this group, though, even beyond this class, there's a whole network of people who have stood behind us. For each of us, there's a person or people who offered support and generally made law school possible. We each had someone. My someone was my wife, Faith. Faith is the one who encouraged me to go back to school and was willing to work so that we could pay the rent while I spent all day not making money in class in the library. <laughs> She offered encouragement and love after physically exhausting, mentally draining days. She put up with me during finals, which is more than is fair to ask of anybody, and she even listened intently while I rambled excitedly on about whatever new concept we'd learned, like the degrees of mens rea or the state speech doctrine or about how Congress can abrogate state sovereign immunity pursuant to its 14th Amendment Section 5 powers. Um, she even managed to keep her eyes from glazing over too, obviously, uh, which is the true sign of love and support. Without faith there to support me every step of the way, there was no way I'd be standing in this room today. She was my supporting rock and my life raft to sanity. 
Even though the diploma will only have my name on it, it is something that we earned together. I literally do not have the words to say how incredibly thankful I am to her for everything that she did and still does. And I really hope that each one of you had your own faith. The fact that the room is so filled today tells me that you did. The people who are here to celebrate with us today are as deserving of recognition as those of us who are going to walk across the stage. It is you, the spouses, parents, partners, siblings, cousins, and remarkably tolerant friends who made everything we did possible. On behalf of all of us graduating, let me extend our sincere thanks and appreciation. We would not be here without you. Thank you also to the professors who have taught and shaped us. No matter how much we helped each other and how much support we got from outside of the school, uh, we wouldn't know much actual law without you. Uh, I especially must thank Professors Tebby, Trammell, Gora, and Bentley, who were great mentors in addition to being great teachers. They are exemplars of the general excellence of the Brooklyn faculty that we together have been able to enjoy over the last three years. They have literally taught us everything we know. Oliver Wendell Holmes once wrote that the life of the law has not been logic, it has been experience. For the last three years, we have filled our brains with logic. Now, it's time to get some experience. As we become real live lawyers and go out into the world, I know that we will do so as we've done everything else together. Congratulations. That was terrific. Thank you very much, Mr. Moore. Now I ask Sarah Margaret Beer, who was elected by our students to speak on their behalf to become to come forward to address the class. Sabrina. 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 Hi, everyone. I am incredibly honored and grateful to get to speak on behalf of our graduating class today. And that's not just because I love to hear myself talk. I do. But because I recognize how fortunate I am to have spent the last three years with all of you. For me, the company I keep is very important which I understand doesn't sound like an original thought, but three years ago, before I started law school and met all of you, I lost my father. And the thing about losing someone who is so incredibly important to you is that suddenly, all of those things that they tried to teach you your entire life actually become important to you. Um, my father was a wonderful man, probably due in large part to the fact that he wasn't a lawyer. <laughs> um, he wasn't a lawyer, uh, he wasn't a politician, and he didn't have any academic accolades to speak of, of which to speak. Um, <laughs> but that didn't matter, because he gave me an incredible gift. And by way of example, my father taught me to really learn from and to appreciate the company that I keep. And for me, as I hope is true for all of us sitting here today, the company I kept during law school really made all the difference. I'm talking about you guys. So, I feel like this would not be a proper law school send-off if it didn't at least attempt to bring back some memories of our favorite activity as 1Ls, briefing cases. Um, on our very first day of law school, a very wise professor told us to brief every case that we read. Now, as it may be true for me and maybe some of you, I probably have not briefed a case on my own since we read Penoyer versus Neff in civil procedure. But I thought I might give it one last try here today and organize my thoughts about this graduating class the way we might have briefed a case not so long ago. So here it goes. Case name. In re, class of 2014. Parties. The petitioners are a class of graduates 
at the best law school, in the best borough, in the best city, in the greatest state, in the best country in the world. As I am sure Dean Allard will soon tell you. <laughs> Issue. What kind of company will these graduates be after leaving here today? Procedural history. Everything leading up to today. Facts. Most of the members of this class matriculated to school as strangers. The members were divided into small groups of 20, large groups of 80, and were to never see the other 300 members of the class again <laughs> until their second year. Some students became friends, some students became gunners, and some students became busier than they had ever been before. And then, classes began. Some students joined clubs, some joined journals and moot court, and some even managed to devote some time to something that wasn't law school. And I don't just mean drinking at law school events, though I think one or two did find time for that. At present day, most of the members of the class still remember the original groups that they were divided into their first year. And many, as just evidenced by John, will argue that their group was the best. I am here today to set the record straight that all other groups, aside from my group, group three, are wrong because group three is, was, and always will be the best. Analysis. I was there in the room at our convocation when then professor and now judge Claire Kelly read an extensive list of all the achievements that the members of this class had made before coming to law school. And I distinctly remember sitting there and thinking, wow, these people are so much cooler than I am. And I also remember thinking, okay, if I can become friends with just one person, that would be great. Now, Fortunately for me, sometimes first impressions really are accurate, and the members of this class actually are pretty great. Now, that is not to say that we are without our faults, as I am sure that all of you sitting here today in support of us could attest. I cannot imagine that it has been easy to love us over the past three years, when we thought that whatever we had going on was far more important than whatever it was that you had going on. <laughs> or when we thought a fun topic of conversation might be how you should draft your will. <laughs> now, hopefully over these years, despite that, you have known how grateful we are to have you. And in case you have not heard it enough, Thank you. Thank you, moms, especially my mom. Thank you. Thank you, dads. Thank you, aunts, uncles, less successful siblings. <laughs> Cousins, grandparents, spouses, significant others, professors and children, for all the, and friends, for all that you have done over these years. My friend John over there said it right when he said that we did not do this alone. Without the support of those closest to us, none of us would be half as wonderful as we think we are. <laughs> your support and your love has made it possible for the members of this class to be advocates for refugee asylum, for reproductive justice, and for veterans' rights to become future clerks for some of the most prestigious judges, associates at some of the most prominent firms, and public servants for some of the most respected offices in this country. And let us not forget that over the past three years, among us, some have even been human beings, and been musicians in bands, trained and completed half marathons, and raised children, all while getting their law degrees. So thank you.
holding. The court held that this class is, has been, and likely will remain great company to keep and issued an injunction that the members, through the miracles of social media or otherwise, find a way to stay connected. Because even though we came to school as strangers, that isn't how we should leave here today. I hope that over the past three years, I have made my mother and my father proud and been good company for you to keep. Because you have certainly been wonderful company to me, and it truly has made all the difference. So thank you for that. And congratulations, class of 2014. We did it. I want to thank Sabrina, formerly known as Sarah. <laughs> it is now my great personal pleasure to introduce Barry Salzberg, Chief Executive Officer of Deloitte, Touche, and Tomatsui. Mr. Salzberg is recognized worldwide as an innovator who gives generously of his time and his resources to the community and the next generation of leaders. Above all, he is an exemplar of how talent, perseverance, and active leadership Notable traits that BLS alumni all share, and all of you share, can have a positive impact on the world. Mr. Salzberg joined Deloitte upon graduation from Brooklyn Law School, and over the course of almost 36 years, has risen through a variety of leadership roles to the firm's highest level. Throughout his career, his corporate career, Responsibility has been a defining priority. Mr. Salzberg has been a key driver behind many of Deloitte's most celebrated programs, including a diversity and inclusion initiative and women's initiative, which have won awards, accolades from Fortune, Business Week, Working Mother, and Diversity, Inc., among other media. These and other measures have further enhanced Deloitte standing as one of the world's big four professional service firms. Beyond these well-known professional achievements, Mr. Salzberg is widely renowned as a humanitarian. He is currently serve, serves as chairman of the Board of College Summit, a national nonprofit dedicated to increasing college enrollment rates among students in low income and communities nationwide. He also served as chairman of the United Way Worldwide Board of Trustees and is chair emeritus of the YMCA of Greater New York. Closer to home, Mr. Salzberg has long been among the law school's most active champions. In addition to establishing two scholarships, he played a central role in the development of the law school's boot camp a groundbreaking program designed to teach valuable skills for succeeding in the business world. In its first two years, this intense mini MBA offered free of charge and for course credit during winter break has drawn more than 400 students, many of whom are here today. In recognition of his dedication to Brooklyn Law School, Mr. Salzberg was honored in 2011 at the inaugural Robert W. Cattell <coughs> <excuse me, coughs> Awards Dinner for Civic Leadership. He was also presented with the Alumnus of the Year Award in November of 2007. Today we recognize him for his innovative leadership and remarkable achievements as the Chief Executive Officer of the world's largest private professional service organization. His tireless commitment to education, diversity in the workplace, and tomorrow's leaders, and his unwavering dedication to his alma mater. We're extraordinarily proud of Mr. Salzberg's accomplishments and grateful for his close partnership with the law school. And we are now honored to bestow upon him our highest degree. Will Mr. Salzberg and Dean Allard 
Please join me at the podium. Mrs. Salzberg, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Brooklyn Law School, I admit you to the degree of Juris Doctor, Honoris Causa, and cause the appropriate hood to be placed on your shoulders, and in token thereof, I present you with this diploma. <laughs> We will now hear from Mr. Salzberg, a member of the class of 1977 and, of course, of 2014. Thank you, Chairman Sabotnik and Dean Allard for granting me this honor and for the invitation to speak today. And congratulations to the class of 2014, of which I am now a member. I am definitely very pleased to be here today, uh, especially extra special for me since I was sitting where you are sitting some 37 years ago. I remember that day, and I remember that my mother, who had lived in Brooklyn for most of her life, was beaming. And my wife was thinking, finally, he's getting a full-time job. But I don't remember what the commencement speaker said. And I suspect you won't remember what I said either. Maybe you'll remember that your speaker was someone who ran some kind of large organization and resembled Dr. Phil. <laughs> and maybe you'll remember that his nephew was a classmate of yours. He's sitting amongst you today. David. Congratulations. We are all very proud of you. Anyway, I realize that I'm the only obstacle between you and your diploma. So let's get to the speech, which will explore four themes. First, what Brooklyn, the borough, the college, and the law school mean to me personally. Second, how a legal education can benefit you, your career path, whatever trajectory it may take, and wider society. Third, the opportunities presented by Brooklyn's transformation. And fourth, how your generation can help redefine leadership and problem solving at a time when traditional approaches aren't working. I'll start with a subject that's near and dear to my heart, and that's Brooklyn. I'm always happy to be in the borough that's given us such luminaries, ranging from Jackie Gleason, any of you remember Jackie Gleason, <laughs> to Jimmy Fallon, Jerry Seinfeld, to Jay-Z. The common denominator among those of us from Brooklyn is more than an ability to tell a joke or write a song. Consider the borough's official motto given to it by its Dutch founders which in English means, in unity, their strength. The motto speaks to what's special about Brooklyn. This was the site of a key battle during the Revolutionary War that showcased American resolve and determination. And the anti-slavery activity here in the 1850s helped lay the intellectual groundwork for the Emancipation Proclamation. It became a place where young couples could buy a home raise a family, 
and see to it that their children would have opportunities they never had. That's the story of my parents. My dad was a postal worker. My mom was a bank clerk. We lived in Brownsville, then East Flatbush, and eventually Canarsie. Brooklyn was and is a part of me, a big part. It's where I'm from, and it's who I am. I attended Tilden High School, then chose Brooklyn College. Money was very tight, so I lived at home and worked full time. I was only the second person in my family ever to go to college. An older sister was first. I had a great experience at college where I met my wife, Evelyn. With great advice and encouragement from her and her family, Brooklyn Law School was a natural next step. I wanted to develop an ability to think through problems, to challenge traditions, and to learn to develop and defend a point of view. Law school provided all of that and a lot more. I was deeply involved in moot court. In fact, I was chairman for two years and learned how to present cogent and persuasive arguments. I learned how to answer questions on my feet. I learned how the other side thinks. My law school education gave me a rock-solid foundation for the future. It was one of the factors, maybe even the most important factor, that enabled me to perform at a high level throughout my career at Deloitte. The path to becoming global CEO was much smoother and faster, I am sure, as a result of the knowledge and skills I gained from going to law school here. A lot has changed since I graduated from law school. TVs have gotten bigger and flatter, computers smaller and lapels narrower. But one thing hasn't changed. There's still a great need for people in the workforce with skills such as analytical thinking and precise writing, underpinned by a comprehensive understanding of the law. Anyone who fits that profile will be prepared to enter a wide range of professions, including law, business, government, and the nonprofit sector. Employers also want people who have not only a commitment to ethics and integrity, but an understanding of why they matter. I know lawyers get a lot of ribbing. I do. But the truth is, that there is a strong commitment to professional responsibility among lawyers, focused on serving clients, but also upholding the oath one takes when becoming an attorney. One element of the legal profession I've always admired is the deep commitment to pro bono work. Attorneys working on pro bono cases have won a number of landmark cases throughout the history of this country, including Tennessee versus Scopes, which ruled against statutes that prohibited the teaching of evolution. Miranda versus Arizona, which gave criminal suspects the right to remain silent and to legal counsel. And Loving versus Virginia, which declared that laws prohibiting interracial marriage were unconstitutional. It's clear that the law can be a powerful tool to help groups or individuals correct what are perceived to be and often are injustices. As one firm with a proud pro bono history has pointed out, legal rights often mean little without lawyers to vindicate them. I hope all of you, whether you practice law or not, will make time to assist those less fortunate. But as many of you know, the legal profession is changing, driven by new regulations, new technologies, and evolving demographics. Change in the legal market can be unsettling for lawyers who only know one way of practicing law. You have the benefit of not being tethered to the past. Use the changing environment to seize emerging opportunities. You don't have to look far to find opportunity. Much of it is right here in Brooklyn. You've been in law school during the so-called Brooklyn Renaissance. We all know about the Barclay Center which brought professional sports back to Brooklyn, as well as 2,000 jobs. Former borough president Marty Markowitz said of the Nets moving in, this is redemption. This is Brooklyn getting its respect back. 
There's something to that. Some of you here today might remember when the Dodgers played at Ebbets Field in Flatbush. Well, it was 57 years ago today that the Dodgers were given permission to move to California. I was three, so I failed to recognize the significance at the time. But irrespective of my personal lack of knowledge of today's sports, it feels good to have a pro team back in Brooklyn. The Nets are just one reason there's a cachet attached to Brooklyn that didn't exist when I was going to school here many years ago. At the time, Brooklyn was perhaps best known as the setting for a popular television show, Welcome Back, Cotter. It introduced America to a young actor named John Travolta, who said things like, up your nose with a rubber hose. <laughs> Today, Brooklyn is much more than a hotbed for aspiring comedians, actors, and singers. Consider this. In 2012, there were 19,000 new businesses created in Brooklyn. Many of these were in the technology sector. In the immortal words of Dean Allard, Silicon Valley is so yesterday. <laughs> the Brooklyn Renaissance isn't just a lofty concept for me. My family has experienced it firsthand. The eldest of my two sons, Matt, joined with two others 18 months ago to launch a startup in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, called Blue Apron. It delivers ingredients and recipes for meals to households around the entire country. And my younger son, Sean, worked for a successful startup, Dropio, that recently was bought by Facebook. There are countless other startups that call Brooklyn home. Etsy, the online social commerce site. Amplify, which puts technology into the hands of teachers. An energy hub, which makes smart meters that promote efficient energy consumption in homes and offices. With Brooklyn becoming a hub of startup activity, it's great to see the law school getting in on the act with the Center for Urban Business Entrepreneurship. Startups always need advice and often need legal help, particularly related to taxes and intellectual property. Brooklyn Law School students and graduates can and will and should provide that trusted counsel. Your fresh thinking will be a stark contrast to the Brooklyn Law students of my generation. We were pretty conventional. We had different aspirations for a very different time. We just wanted a steady job. And some of us, like me, stayed with the same employer for our entire career. It's unheard of today. But that risk-averse posture has changed. A survey done by my firm reveals that the millennial generation are more inclined to be entrepreneurial than older generations. Regardless of whether you start up a business, I hope you develop that spirit of entrepreneurship. You can be an entrepreneur within any kind of organization. I call it intrapreneurship. Hustle. Look for unmet needs. Dare to be different than it's called for. Your generation is also more connected and more collaborative than any who have come before it. Take today as an example. Graduation parties organized on Facebook. Selfies wearing your cap and gown instantly shared on Instagram. Venues for family dinners chosen on Yelp. Or adding your classmates on LinkedIn so you can stay in touch. This type of information sharing and connection breeds fresh thinking. And as our research shows, there's a clear need for fresh thinking in public life. Young people have largely lost faith in the ability of government and business to address the key challenges facing us all. Economic security, youth unemployment, access to education, the skills gap, and the many social issues such as access to water, obesity, crime, and personal data privacy. Millennials see the need to redefine how problems are addressed but no single sector or organization can solve these issues alone. Governments, businesses, and nonprofits must partner together to pool resources, share innovative ideas, and generate solutions. Consider a project pioneered by Dean Kamen, 
who invented the Segway. He saw that nearly 800 million people did not have access to clean water, which is a leading cause of child mortality in the developing world. He partnered with Coca-Cola to develop a revolutionary water purification system, then use the company's global network to distribute it. Different sectors working together to make the most of their collective abilities. You are perfectly positioned by virtue of your youth and your outstanding education here at the law school to help advance these kinds of unorthodox solutions to challenges big and small. In preparation for today, I reflected on my own graduation from Brooklyn Law School back in 1977 and what I wish I had known back then. In particular, there are three lessons that took me many years to learn. So before I leave you, I'd like to share these with you. First, never be afraid to ask for help. I can guarantee that at some point in the next few years, you're going to be overwhelmed with something at work or something at home and maybe both. Pulling an all-nighter, which may have worked in law school, won't be the answer. There's a simpler solution. Reach out and ask for help. No big deal, just ask. The fact is people are flattered. Even senior executives, if the request is sincere, because they know all too well, many people help them. Second, never be afraid to offer help. In today's multidisciplinary, multicultural, highly collaborative world, the winner is not the one with the slickest agenda and the sharpest elbows. It's the one who can bring people together and make big things happen. It's about bringing to work what you might call a collaborative mindset. Never be afraid to help somebody else shine. Today, the very best people are both supremely good at what they do and supremely good at working with others to help make them successful. Do that and rest assured, sooner or later, it will be your turn. Third, never be afraid to be yourself and stick to your principles. Be yourself. Don't let titles like partner change you. I'm still that kid from Brooklyn even after all this time. Stay close to your roots, to who you are, to the person your family raised you to be. Not only will you be happier, but by having this kind of internal compass, you'll be more prone to make the kinds of ethical decisions that keep individuals and companies and even economies on track. The world has enough go-along, look-the-other-way people. What the world needs, and always needs, are ethically grounded, make-it-happen people. People just like you. From the attentive looks on your faces and your body language, it seems I'm about to accomplish what I set out to do. I will have stopped speaking before you stop listening. <laughs> so go forward then, go and do great things, and above all, go out and have yourself a great life. You've earned it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Barry. That was really a terrific speech, and uh, I want to start over. Uh, our next speaker is Dean Allard, who will address the graduating class. More beer and Salzburg. That sounds like a good law firm. I'm uh, really appreciative of those engaging words and I think we'll be following many of their themes of cooperation <clears throat> uh, and uh, taking on big challenges. So uh, good, 
Good uh, midday, everyone. Trustees, faculty, and staff, alumni, distinguished guests, friends, parents, and family, and most importantly, Brooklyn's Law School's Class of 2014. Our, our return to Brooklyn to celebrate your commencement is the first time in 45 years when graduation was held in the ballroom of the St. George Hotel on Court Street, Henry Street. It's the first time we've been back in this magnificent opera house since 1962, 52 years ago. Our presence here today signifies that your class is at the forefront of the borough's renaissance that uh, Barry Salzberg spoke to you so eloquently about the renaissance in education, business, architecture, high technology, entrepreneurship, creative and performing arts, culture, and my personal favorite, food. Congratulations on earning your degree from the best law school in Brooklyn. <laughs> and Sabrina already told you what that means, so I don't have to say that it's the best law school in the biggest and most vibrant borough in the greatest city in the leading state in the best nation on the planet. So I won't say that. <laughs> but you have that working for you. Just think of the history of this place where we gather today. The Brooklyn Academy of Music is the oldest performing arts center and conservatory in America. First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln attended the first opera performance here when it was opened in 1861. Booker T. Washington called for full emancipation, full emancipation on this stage, and Mark Twain entertained large audiences with his stories. 1940, uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt on, appeared on stage to a packed house of 2,200. And I think we have more here today, but he had 700 people on stage behind him and 6,000 people outside. The performances since then have ranged from Rudolf Nereyev, the great ballet dancer, in his first post-defection debut in America, to Robert Redford, to Paul Simon, to Jimmy Kimmel. And last month, just last month, um, most of you attended an event here with Justice Antonin Scalia speaking at the Brooklyn Law School program on individual rights and liberties and um, national uh, security matters. Um, the list of people who have been here is jaw-dropping, yet your presence on this stage in a few moments in many ways is more important and more significant. By ending what we call your education, today you're beginning your real education as lawyers. Notwithstanding the joy and pride that you all deservedly feel at this moment, <clears throat> I'm compelled to speak to you with a sense of candor and urgency. <clears throat> My question for you is, if not you, then who? You are all needed. The truth is that there are too few qualified, motivated new lawyers who can, as lawyers have always done, serve as architects of economic growth and opportunity, champions of liberty and equal justice under law, and as guardians of our incredible, cantilevered, self-correcting system of limited government. Yes, you heard me. There is a shortage of lawyers who are prepared for the new world we live in. Conventional wisdom and its cheap cousin, popular opinion, tell us that there's a glut of lawyers, too many lawyers. In reality, there's a large and exploding unmet demand for lawyers. <clears throat> there is today a shortage of lawyers in new fields, many new fields, and a shortage of affordable legal services for all but the wealthy. And there's also an expanding need to advise small businesses and new businesses. Now more than ever you're needed, we need you to bury the complacency of recent years and lead us uh, to a better place. Today, though the state bar examiners may have something to say about it, you are lawyers and that is a noble profession, proudly independent and connected to the unselfish service of others. Barry Salzberg, your commencement speaker, is a beacon 
for all of us, showing what a graduate of our law school can do to make a difference and how to serve the public interest from the heart of the private sector. His career proves that doing well and doing good are not at war with each other. Whether your graduates, whether you graduates will serve as judges, like former dean and now judge I, Leo Glasser, who graces us on, with his presence on this stage, or whether you become public officials, prosecutors, public defenders, family lawyers, partners in a firm, or sole practitioners, whether you become successful businessmen, advocates for unpopular causes, drum majors for justice, or successful corporate counsels, as was Abraham Lincoln. <clears throat> the diploma you will soon receive is not meant to be a mere slip of paper collecting dust with other mementos and tchotchkes, <clears throat> to use the Latin phrase. <clears throat> you have worked hard to sharpen the finest tool, a tool Barry Salzberg talked about, the finest tool ever known to mankind, your mind. And you learned the skills to use this powerful tool to build bridges between chasms, create opportunity, fight vigorously but peacefully for what is right. <clears throat> you were also well equipped to resolve deeply felt disputes in your communities, in the nation, in the world. There is much work for you to do. Looking out at this impressive crowd, I wonder, I can't help but think, which of you will have a hand in brightening the future by addressing critical issues um, that relate to the economy, foreign policy, and our political system. Who among you, I wonder, will deal with the fragility and inequality of our economy? Who will be redirecting our foreign policy in a world of shared power, shared problems, where the rule of law often sounds and seems like an oxymoron? Who is going to have a hand overcoming the paralysis that afflicts our national dialogue on issues like simmer, uh, simmering immigration issues or um, by unleashing the power of biomedical research to treat uh, disease and prevent disease while improving and working on affordability and maintaining the humanity we all endure in a world of biomedical discovery. Who among you is going to be instrumental in pulling back our claim to privacy of our personal information? Who among you is going to work out the new rules of the road for everything uh, from Uber to driverless cars to pilotless airplanes? And on and on in this whole world of new discovery and innovation, um, including the incredible advent centered here in Brooklyn of 3D printing. And finally, who among you is going to help stop violence against ourselves, finally taking on laws relating to guns and mental health that are simply not working? <clears throat> now, the good news is that to solve these problems, you must not work alone. It's not possible to take on these challenges alone. Cooperation is essential. In fact, uh, it is likely that my, and no progress will be made unless you're willing to work in concert with many, many others, but you out there in our graduating class have learned how to be the leaders in such an effort. You can be those leaders. And I think you heard from both of our outstanding student speakers that's that what they have in mind, and that is how they excelled in law school, is by working together. Now, you can do it. Your, your class speakers each spoke about how cooperative all of you were with each other, and you have already been standing on the shoulders of many people. Um, my ideas today are not my own. Uh, many of the things I've said have come from the words of Lincoln's second inaugural, the writings of Learned Hand, Holmes, Cardozo, Senator Bill Bradley's new book, and Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and Sotomayor. The, you've also, uh, and you, you, many of you, you heard Holmes quoted in the valedictorian speech. Uh, many of you ha know those words. 
<clears throat> but you've also <clears throat> gained the ideas and the thoughts about what I'm talking about um, from your faculty uh, who have conveyed to you the knowledge and the training that is necessary to make a dent. And besides that, you've come to us already, I think inclined because of your motivation to become lawyers and because of the upbringing you have had <clears throat> from your family and your whole relation, you're inclined to try to make that difference. So don't forget that you really have what it takes if you reach out <clears throat> to others to help. And also along the way, just remember how many other people at law school and your life ahead also in a special way make a difference. Like probably the most popular person in the law school uh, on our staff, Claude Callender. Claude is around here someplace, I know. Or take, for example, <laughs> Uncle Claude. Uh, Louis Rosario, who's the uh, head of uh, the public safety operation and is based mainly over at File Hall. Or my former secretary, yeah, Louis. And, and I single out just a few. I could go on and on, and I won't, but I could go on and on to mention that these are people that are often unsung heroes who we don't always notice, but they make it all possible. They make it all work. And another who comes to mind is my secretary, former secretary, Mary Lee Bedford, who uh, was a Dominican nun for 11 years and became a pioneer and one of the first women in St. Francis uh, College and then was a teacher in parochial schools and then came to the law school and worked with five deans uh, and uh, sadly passed away suddenly three weeks before she was to retire last fall. Uh, she made an impact on people, um, thousands of people, and I know that because of the large number of graduates who wrote to us and emailed us and called <clears throat> on her passing. And she's an example of the very best of Brooklyn Law School. And those are the kind of people who have made it possible for you to take on the big challenges <clears throat> that I'm uh, talking about. Um, I believe that as law students, you have had a glimpse of the future inhabited, a future inhabited by free people in a free world. I, I know that you can imagine an even better world than the one we now inhabit. And I know your faculty Again, your own proclivities inspired by your upbringing that is going to motivate you to fight to that good fight, fight that good fight, and do your best, and reclaim the legacy that reflects our best selves. Now, today I'm <clears throat> honored to acknowledge two faculty members who have had a significant influence on Brooklyn Law School and generations of Brooklyn Law students. It's a bittersweet moment for all of us to wish them well as they retire and assume the status a professor's emeriti. I'll probably hear from the bishop whether I got the Latin right or wrong. Um, first, I acknowledge Professor Marilyn Walter. Professor Walter joined the faculty in 1980 as the founding director of Brooklyn Law School's legal writing program. Under her leadership, she has developed one of the most highly regarded programs in the country. In addition to running the writing program, over her career at Brooklyn Law School, Professor Walter taught many other courses through the years, including first year legal research and writing, employment discrimination, fundamentals of drafting, and the law and literature seminar, among other courses. Outside of the law school, her stature in the legal writing community is epic. She served in many important roles as chair of the American Association of Law Schools writing section, as a member of the Board of Directors of the Legal Writing Institute and as a member of the American Bar Associates Commit Committee on Communication Skills, to name just a few. In 2005, Professor Walter received the Association of American Law Schools Legal Writing Award in recognition of her pioneering leadership, extraordinary vision, and outstanding service. <clears throat> she co-authored the book with Helene Shapo and our very own Professor Betsy Fagens, titled Writing and Analysis in the Law, is and it's considered a classic and one of the most widely used first-year writing texts for law students. It's in its fifth edition. 
Professor Walter, please come forward so that I can present you with this uh, memento that, your that we wanted to, you to have. We are for forever grateful for your many years of dedicated service to the law school and your influential contributions to legal writing, and thank you for your selfless dedication to generations of Brooklyn Law School students. The second individual who we acknowledge today has been teaching at Brooklyn Law School for 50 years. Think about that. <clears throat> Since 1964. It's just remarkable that Professor Richard Farrell uh, is, uh, has been with us that long and he, I almost said he deserves no introduction, but the fact is that he, he really needs no introduction. Um, <clears throat> Dick, I'm sorry, that was a typo. Uh, <clears throat> Dick graduated from Brooklyn Law School in 1964, and he celebrated his 50th law school reunion just a few weeks ago. No surprise, he was an outstanding student, and he served as the editor-in-chief of the Brooklyn Law Review. Following graduation, he joined the Brooklyn Law School faculty, with the exception of a few years clerking for Judge John F. Shalepi of the New York State Court of Appeals. He has taught for the past 50 years, as I said. His courses have included Conflict of Laws, New York Civil Practice, Evidence, and the Federal Procedure course. He's had a profound influence on literally thousands upon thousands of Brooklyn Law School students. His influence has extended beyond our halls as a preeminent lecturer to lawyers and judges on matters of evidence and New York Civil Practice. For at least 30 plus years, he has traversed the state, lecturing to countless bar associations, actively imparting the wealth of case law and the knowledge in this area. <clears throat> From 1977 to 1992, Professor Farrell served as the reporter for the Pattern Instruction Committee of the Association of Supreme Court Justices. In addition, he won a double jeopardy case in the U.S. Supreme Court. But Professor Farrell is most well known for his scholarship and in particular his treatise on evidence. He is the author of Prince Richardson on Evidence, the 11th edition and 12th edition, and annual supplements. This treatise is virtually in every courtroom in the state and it continues to be one of the most cited texts in New York courts. Dick has received numerous honors and recognition for his achievements. The Catholic Lawyers Guild presented him with the President's Award the New York State Bar Association Criminal Justice Section bestowed on him an outstanding contribution uh, uh, in the field of Criminal Justice Award, and in 2005, Brooklyn Law School named him the Wilbur A. Levin Distinguished Service Professor of Law. It is hard to imagine Brooklyn Law School without the one and only Professor Richard Farrell. Professor Farrell, will you please come forward so that I can present to you a memento from your colleagues and from the Board of Trustees for your incredible contributions. If you will permit me, and I suspect you will, <clears throat> there's one more member of the faculty who we all honor today. As the Joseph Craya Dean, I couldn't be prouder to be associated with this institution's most memorable individual. Professor Joe Craya truly epitomizes the spirit and vibrancy of Brooklyn Law School. He has taught at the law school for 66 years and counting. He tells me if he gets at least 10 mem members in his commercial paper class, he'll come back next year. 
<clears throat> Otherwise, it's not interesting enough for him. <clears throat> Born on the Lower East Side to immigrant parents, Joe obtained working papers at the age of 14. Attending and dropping out of a series of vocational law schools, high schools, high schools, <clears throat> Joe finally attended Bay Ridge Evening High School at night, graduating second in his class. He then attended Brooklyn College at night for four years. Before he enlisted in the Army, Joe attended law school while working as the chief clerk of a Brooklyn draft board. After his discharge as a second lieutenant in 1944, Joe returned to working for the draft board and to studying law. He attended classes four nights a week and unable to attend on the fifth night, he read law for two hours a week in an administrator's office. In his senior year, Joe <clears throat> was invited to join the Law Review, where he so impressed the then dean, Jerome Prince, that he was offered a temporary position after graduation as a librarian. When the law school finally hired a full-time librarian, Dean Prince asked Professor Crea to consider accepting an instructor's position. And so it was that in 1948, the year that Truman was reelected, and the year when the United States ratified the Marshall Plan, Joe Crea began his career as a teacher and a member of the faculty at Brooklyn Law School. Early on in his career, Joe broke with the tradition of using older, rather dry cases to teach case method. Instead, he selected vivid and relevant factual cases to drive home his lessons. At first, he taught torts, then legal research and bailments, and eventually through the years, he taught more than 20 different courses. Over the past six decades, Crea has been a mentor to Brooklyn Law School. The professor everybody w would talk to a man totally lacking in pretense. Today, whenever I meet alumni, they always ask me one question. Is Joe Crea still around? And when I tell them that indeed he is, they begin to regale me with stories about the wisdom he's imported, imparted to them. They can, he probably imported some of it too. <clears throat> they can remember in crystal detail some of his well-known Crayaisms like never drop your briefcase and run. <laughs> Undoubtedly, his style of teaching really got through to his students. In a cover feature on Joe in the BLS Law Notes about 10 years ago, he told the editor that he graduated from law school in 1947. He had no idea that he would make a career as a law professor. He said that he wanted to become a practicing lawyer to change the world, but thankfully for all of us, Fate conspired to keep him here, pursuing what seemed so clear in retrospect to be his true calling, teaching. For six decades, six decades, Professor Crea has used his intelligence, wit, remarkable capacity for ceaseless hard work, and dogged determination and unquenchable spirit to inspire his students. He has also been a sage together, a sage teacher to have <clears throat> a dozen deans, sometimes operating as a shadow dean. I've been lucky, lucky enough to be the beneficiary of much of his good advice and some of his candid advice. <laughs> Joe, today we award you the Wilbur A. Levin Distinguished Service Medal. Bill Levin, a member of the Board of Trustees from 1980 to 2005, like you, contributed so much to the law school, to our students, and to our profession. We have only awarded this medal twice before, once to Professor Richard Farrell, who you've just seen, and another uh, to Dean Henry Hank Haverstick, Dean Haverstick, who is our Dean of Admissions. Where? He's over here. <laughs> I need, it takes a village. I need a lot of help. Joe, your influence on Brooklyn Law School students has been profound and persuasive, pervasive, <clears throat> and persuasive. There is no greater legacy than that and no one more deserving of this honor. Please join me in congratulating the one, the only, and American original, Professor Joseph Crea.
Joe says, he's moving a little slow today, he says that his, his leg, right leg, carried him for 99 years, and now it's telling him that he's got to carry it for a while. <laughs> it's amazing. The month I was born, Learned Hand addressed a large group of educators in his native Albany. By the way, I find it oddly amusing that the jurist and philosopher with the unforgettable name changed his name. He was born as Billings Hand, but he took up his middle family name Learned because he thought Billings sounded too pompous. <laughs> you can look it up. <clears throat> but he could write. His words have touched me and perhaps you will reflect on them a, met, a bit, on a bit. Our nation is embarked on a venture as yet unproved. We have set our hopes upon a community in which men and women shall be given unchecked control of their own lives. That community is in peril. It is invaded from within. It is threatened from without. It faces a test it may fail to pass. The choice is ours. I say to you, the choice is yours. The mutual confidence on which all else depends can be maintained by, only by an open mind and by free discussion. I know that many, many years from now, Joe Crea will find you, and he will ask you, members of the class of 2014, have you given your best, and what will your answer be? <laughs> okay. Well, with that resounding conclusion, We'll now uh, turn, I'm sure, to the next stage, and I'll return the festivities to the Chairman of the Board, Stuart Sabotnik. Okay, we, hey, we've come here for a little matter of uh, awarding diplomas, and uh, I think we can rate that as probably the number one item of the day, so... Uh, I would, uh, we will now proceed with this awarding of diplomas with the Masters of Law degrees for the class of 2014. I am pleased to announce that our students selected Professor Alan Trammell as this year's faculty honoree. He writes about and teaches civil procedure, and he also teaches a seminar on recent Supreme Court decisions. Professor Trammell, would you please come forward to join Deans Brakeman, Reiser, Cahill, and Lang in announcing the candidates for the Masters of Law and Juris Doctor degrees. school welcomed its third class of LLM students this past August. These students are lawyers who are trained abroad but came to Brooklyn and to Brooklyn Law School to develop a deeper understanding of American law. They achieved that goal and brought experience with the legal systems of Ukraine, Uganda, Ireland, Brazil, Spain, Qatar, Mexico, Italy, Turkey, Colombia, and India to our classrooms, enriching the educational experience. Professor Lawrence Solon, who is the Director of Graduate Education, will help award these degrees. Would you please join Dean Allard and Dean Haverstick? Mr. Sabotnik, 
Eleven candidates have successfully pursued the program leading to the degree of Master of Laws. The faculty has found that they meet the standards of excellence and have demonstrated the personal qualities that make them worthy holders of this Brooklyn Law School degree. Will these candidates please rise? <laughs> okay, by virtue of the authority vested in me, I confer upon each of you the degrees of Masters of Laws with all the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. Please come to the stage. I ask that you all remain on the stage after your names are called for a group photo with Dean Allard and Professor Solon. Luis Calderon. Congratulations, Luis. Ruth Corcoran. Alejandra Vargas. Francesca Chiarochi. Olga Komiak. Faisal Alhababi. Hasret Shenyert. Patrick E. Bukenya. Shivani Verma. Fabiola Gomez Dos Santos Charlie. Patricia B. Vignola Pena. We will now proceed with the awarding of Juris Doctor's Degrees for the Class of 2014. Will the students who are receiving their degrees, summa cum laude, please rise. Mr. Sabotnik, these five candidates have fulfilled with the greatest distinction the requirements for the degree of Juris Doctor and are entitled to receive the degree summa cum laude. By virtue of the authority vested in me, I confer upon you the degree of Juris Doctor summa cum laude with all the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. Please come forward to the stage. If you look in your commencement program, you'll find a number of group awards for membership in our scholarly journals and the Moot Court Honor Society, and for students who completed fellowships and volunteered their service to the law school through various activities. We're very proud of these recipients and want to take a moment now to congratulate them on their significant achievements. Also, in a few weeks, the faculty will be selecting the recipients of our graduation awards and prizes. The complete list of awardees, along with the prize and award descriptions, will be posted on our website, and the recipients will be notified individually. Without further ado, diplomas. John D. Moore. Rebecca J. Gannon. Douglas R. Keaton. Stephen A. Savoka. John H. Rene.
Will the students who are receiving their degrees magna cum laude please rise. <laughs> Mr. Savatnik, these 36 candidates have fulfilled with great distinction the requirement for the degree of Juris Doctor and are entitled to re receive the degree magna cum laude. By virtue of the authority vested in me, I confer upon you the degree of Juris Doctor magna cum laude with all the rights and privileges pertaining thereto, please come to the stage. Among this group of candidates are the first of this year's graduates who will be receiving diplomas from someone seated on the stage. This is one of Brooklyn Law School's favorite graduation traditions. When a student has a relative who is a graduate, we make that person a part of the ceremony. Benjamin P. Argyle. Stuart Gold. Jonathan Engel. Braden P. Hasney. David N. Heitner. Ashley Stein. Uh, Victoria Galatne. Jana Isabel Heimowitz. She'll be presenting her mother, Sharon Katz, class of 1981, who will be presenting the degree to her. David Giller. Anuska Claire Hamlin. Nathaniel Everhart. With his son, Henry. Okay. Thank you. Respond, Josh. Okay. Josh, fight. Uh, Josh's father, Kenneth R. Fight, class of 1977, will be presenting his degree. Okay. Okay. Alexander V. Bondarenko. <laughs> Andrew Pollock. John J. Nolan. His uncle, Kenneth Nolan, class of 1977, will be presenting his degree. Caitlin E. Proper. Lauren Lapari. Brittany D. McGrath. Eric C. Oliver. Michael Tytel. Christina Marie Rubel. Her uncle, Richard Ezo, class of 1981, will be presenting her degree. Leanne M. Welds. Matthew J. Lammert. Aaliyah R. Quigley. Tricia R. Lyons. Scout Richters. Melissa Martin. Kimberly F. Sarapika. Andrew D. Sepos. Glenn R. Sheik. Scott A. Folletta. Caitlin E. Dumphy. Aaron Hardy Ogburn. Anthony Zhang. Stephen A. O'Connor. Luke T. Teschler. Will the students who are receiving their degrees, cum laude, please rise. <laughs> Mr. Sabotnik, these 56 candidates have fulfilled with distinction the requirements for the degree of Juris Doctor and are entitled to the added distinction of cum laude. 
By virtue of the authority vested in me, I confer upon you the degree of Juris Doctor Cum Laude with all the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. Please come to the stage. Amanda K. Liu, who will receive her diploma from her father, Tom Liu, class of 1993. Darren M. Trotter. Lisa Okamoto. Tamoy Murakami Se. Michael Say, Sanal Mehta, Sharif Morsi, Jacob Verstandik, Patrick Selvi, Jr., Kristen M. Peltonen. Ava C. Page. Peter S. Siemens. Yonit Rosengarten. Ryan G. Marcus. Dominic Salyabeni. Gideon A. Martin. Sarah A. Mary. Alana Sieven. Matthew Silver. Elizabeth C. Schauber. Tisha M. Ruggiero. Reed M. Ryan. Michael B. Weiss. Joseph Spadali. Sholem P. Yaffa. Timothy P. Pudiak. Kemshal C. McAndrew. Michael P. Farkas, who will be receiving his degree from his sister-in-law, Lauren Farkas, Class of 2004. Nicole R. Alexa. Caitlin E. Ciolino. Saad M. Yunus. Sarah E. Briglia. Emmanuel Fashikin. Michael Jones. Matthew W. Jacobowitz. Nathan M. Hennigan. Robert G. Huberman. Brian P. Hanley. Evan D. Hay. Michael A. Jaffe. <laughs> Megan E. Graham. <laughs> Setne Akta. <laughs> Chad H. Goizade. Goizade. <laughs> Megan E. Dean. <laughs> Haim. Benolio. Jared R. Killeen. Anna Cordas. Daniel A. Ackerman. Emily Gordon. Lauren N. Ehrlich. Yeah. 
Lara Glass. Vincent J. DeForte. Mr. Sabotnik, 285 candidates, not already named, have su successfully pursued the long and arduous program, leading to the degree of Juris Doctor. The faculty has found that they meet the standards of excellence and have demonstrated their personal qualities that make them worthy holders of the Brooklyn Law School degree. Will these candidates please rise? By virtue of the authority vested in me, I confer upon each of you the degree of Juris Doctor with all the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. And now, under the directions of the marshals, I ask the candidates to please come to the stage row by row. Margaret Beer. Oh, Sabrina Margaret Beer. <laughs> Yasmin A. Sinclair. Christine Marie Latour. Cheryl Wang. Jordan B. Sinclair. Peter A. Tomasino. Jacqueline Spagnola. Jeffrey S. Le Letterman. Mia A. Tamajima. Emily J. McGinnis. Megan D. Sparks. Sarah Thatcher Murphy. Homer B. Turgeon. Congratulations. Boyan R. Toshkoff. Sean Roche. Lior Sapir. Christopher M. Soleski. Austin Mazella. Congratulations. Caitlin E. Fallon. Cassie Maureen Cole. James L. Ansorge. Harrison S. Kleiman. Mark J. Hanna. Edward G. Eisman. Nithin E. Jayadeva. James H. Kyberts. Alexis D. Estrada. Brian S. Hewitt. Nicole Berkovich. Nathan H. Cox. William H. Jameson. Matthew G. Goodwin. Alexander D. Goldman. Sarah Evans DeVita. Congratulations. David P. Berman. Samuel H. Kiera. Leslie C. Bailey. Adam Kubota. Jeffrey D. Bolar. Constantine Chaus. Chiwan A. Chang. 
Kevin P. Albertson. Danielle Chin. Jonathan H. Blankstein. Austin F. Cheng. Andrew M. Gordon. Stephen G. Donaldson. James S. Hoffman. Sarah J. Arena. Elaine M. Driscoll. Dana A. Brady. Carolina Kalushnikova. Christina Bernardo. Christina J. Favela. Ojeku C. Isiku. Elias V. Alarcon. Perry B. Goldman. Chauncey W. Depew. Marin C. Doherty. Imran Ahmed. Peter D. Kosiak. John P. Farnioli. Samuel J. Hahn. Donald G. Glassman. Lindsay H. Branch. Kristen M. Dufour. Hal Berman. Upton Ow. Matthew W. Henry. Jeremy B. Fisher. Christopher Beal. Gabriel M. Goldenberg. Charles A. Galair. Jacob Cohn. Chukwadia Bube Namso Okoli. Sylvester S. Yavana. Ashley S. Raja Karuna. Menti. Vivian Shie. Liel E. Sugar. Megan Menguch. Christina L. Toscano. Hillary A. Weiss. Ellie Weil. Samantha M. <laughs> Samantha M. Simkowitz. 
Emily A. Shore. David Aaron Cinnamon, who will receive his degree from his father, Jay Cinnamon, class of 1963. Ariel S. Camillus. Joshua P. Brady. Charles Aaron Barker. Avi Arunian. Usher G. Grossman, who will receive his degree from his father, Jonathan Grossman, class of 1973. Alexandra K. Giorzi. Matthew Charles DeSero. Jennifer J. Hickey. Maeve Kalaji. Amy Elizabeth Trever. Eugene Bykoff. Michael Bodnev. Melissa S. Lee with Gracie. Claire Rogers and June Rogers. Daniel J. Rothman. Congratulations. Graham L. Travellini. Heather S. Steele. Melissa S. Modesti. Dion A. Schuler. Salar Donovan Ravani. Alexander B. Powell. Rachel L. Weissman. Joanna M. Vesca. Tyre Perlman. Elizabeth Clark Hersey. Tara Johnson. Catherine M. Kusa. Jing Jen. Kathleen T. Conlon. Kevin Curly. Daniel K. Dukergold. John Gomez. Brian J. Kolb. Shlomo Himmel. Sigia Jessica Jang. Youngjun Becky Beck. Michael Ehrenreich. Victoria N. Medley. Josephine Weiss. Gloria Liu. Jenny Chung. Shabri Sharma. Kimberly A. Saliano. Maricela R. Sigona. Lauren Valley. Randall J. Meyer. 
Randall will receive his degree from his fiance, Caroline McKenna, class of 2013. Ryan, Ryan A. Marola. Rebecca L. Newman. Marina Tricorico. Jonathan S. Herzbrunn. Ivan Hoy. Newton Sudath. Catherine Caracapa. Brett Uricchio. Aaron Getman. Alex A. Hampton. Amanda B. Iavoli. David Kober. Jake S. Hirsch. Jake will receive his degree from his brother, Blaine Hirsch, class of 2010. Shane Birnbaum. Sh Shane will receive his degree from his sister, Stephanie Kelly, class of 2008. <laughs> Megan A. Fuller. Emily E. Brandis. Laura R. McKenzie. Alana Rosenthal. August Lincoln Posegay. Adam Ludeman. Mm -hmm. Catherine Palillo. Thomas O. Lavander. Matthew J. Regan. Eugenia I. Zervinskaya. Gregory R. Sarafan. Rebecca Vayner. Hi. Danielle S. Himali. Hi. Perry A. Lasky. Lasica. Veronica M. Jackson. Erin Catherine Erta. <laughs> Ashley E. Cuny. Christina Paulina Chan. Lindsay K. Francis. <laughs> David B. Goldberg, receiving his degree from his great uncle, Barry Salzberg, class of 1977. Robin C. Coote. Tamima Friedman. Thank you. Jeremy Apple. Rachel S. Glasser. Her great uncle. Honorable I. Leo Glasser, class of 1948, former Dean of Brooklyn Law School, will be presenting her degree.
Elizabeth David Dabrowski. Omalola Kuyi. Daniel Kirk Kirkby Kirkaby. Lauren R. Youngkins. Michael D. Soleimani. Jennifer B. Shu. Congratulations. Hi. Allison M. Schachter. Cesar A. Munoz. Michael R. Seda. Luke R. Marcou. Charles, welcome. Jeffrey P. Lowell. Justine M. Pelham. Timothy R. Jones. Joseph Karume James. Jedediah Matthew Bernstein. Sandra Chung. Randy H. Lee. Matthew D. Gasses. Kevin G. Cooper. John Kupcha. Lauren M. Effman. Kenya R. Dillon. Randall L. Morrison, Jr. Michael L. Parakini. Anthony C. and Charlie Varbero. Ricky D. Studley. Rocco A. Totino. Paul Lee. Alan M. Zhao. Richard Scudder. Abby L. Schenkel. Callagy O'Brien. Samuel S. Lee. Christopher Veraki. Michael Kayam. Rebecca F. Furman. Matthew J. Jones. Jason A. Kane. Talia Cohen. Daniel Nelkenbaum. Kevin Lee. Kevin will be receiving his diploma from his brother, Johnny Lee, class of 2001. Mark Newman. Ruben Stein. 
Jacob S. and Ahuba Rubenstein. Emily B. Silverstein. <laughs> Jeffrey Yuan. <laughs> Alan Lesnikova. <laughs> Grant Petrosian. Shayna Weinberg Gordon. Gregory R. Polovin. Rafe M. Soroya. Alexander S. Moskowitz. Manuel M. Maturana. Amy Rosenfeld. Matthew Tarasoff. Paula Uriarte. Daisha A. Reed. Jesse T. Levitsky. Kyle S. Martin. Jesse H. Perigene. Scott J. Melanchuk. Annie Mock. Jeffrey Ling. Summer M. McKee. Adam D. Lynn. Peter N. Trevitsky. Kevin Joseph Tai. Douglas A. Picenti. No, I didn't get that right. What is it? Picentini. Everybody deserves to have it read correctly. Christine Men. Joshua R. Weller. Thomas Slattery. Michael T. Rosa. Christopher Legal. Christopher Reichardt. Rajkamal Singh. Brian D. Lazarus. Cole C. Smith. Thomas Lee. Jenny Zhu. David Zhu. Bona Kwok. Jessica Wong. Britt Stern. Jose Mike Sevilla. Michael Benjamin Ward. Stephen T. Tower.
Okay, we're going to start this part over again because we didn't get it exactly right. Um, in any event, Dean Allard will now close the 113th Brooklyn Law School commencement ceremony, after which I ask that the faculty members and our guests on stage leave the hall first by departing from the stage through the hall and that the students follow the faculty members. I ask that all the guests remain in their seats until the recessional is completed, and I really thank you all for coming, and congratulations. Today, we witness continuity and change. We've gone back to our future by returning to Brooklyn, by celebrating your achievements in the context of the giants who you have known, including those on your faculty, and those who have reached out to you through history. In his second inaugural address, President Abraham Lincoln, speaking to a nation torn apart, did not mince words. <clears throat> he said, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. We must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save the country. If not you, then who? On behalf of the Board of Trustees, the faculty of the Brooklyn Law Schools, I congratulate you on this milestone day. Go out and live a life greatly in the law. Make us as proud of you tomorrow as we are today. Congratulations, class of 2014.